So it is now getting ready to record. Okay. So today we have Cindy Weiner, an expert in native plants, who's going to be talking about various kinds of plants and the things that plants might need. Okay. Um, yeah, so the fruit. There's sort of three parts to this program. The first part is the uh, PowerPoint, which we're about to begin. And after that, there's going to be a video that Joyce took of me out in the Master Gardener Demonstration Gardens at Patrick Ranch. And that was about a month ago. And I'm, I'm, I talk, I'm talking about the things you can see in the garden if you go visit there and how we set up the gardens. And then after that, I'll be talking about some specific plants and their um, positive contributions for wildlife in your garden. So I'm really excited to see that so many people are here and interested in um, creating a wildlife garden or adding more native plants to your wildlife garden that you already have. Um, but I'm warning you that I'm going to be sort of pushing you along to a possible change in mindset. Most people, for most people, I think the top priority of their garden is its aesthetic beauty. And, and you sort of have to, for wildlife gardening, you have to start thinking in terms of top priority being what's good for the wildlife. And, some, and so you have to sort of alter what, what you think is beautiful about your garden. So, um, and the reason, some of the reasons it's important to have um, habitat as the first priority is that it can, you can go back, Joyce. Oh, sorry. Um, is that it, um, you'll be helping replace habitat that's been destroyed by development. You're going to help reverse the trend of species extinction. It's going to make your garden fit in better with the environment. And if you get together with your neighbors and you all have wildlife uh, priorities in your garden, you can actually create a wildlife corridor so that animals can transit from one natural area to a disjunct other natural area using these wildlife corridors. Okay, now we can go. So I want you to look at these pictures and think which garden is more wildlife friendly. And I suspect you probably have a pretty good idea which is the winner here. Um, on the left is sort of the typical new suburban house look that has come to be the style in California where you have a, a, a massive lush green lawn. Oh dear. Sorry about that. Um, you have a sort of a stick tree, and then you have these. Um, I'm very sorry about that. That's my husband's dentist. Um, there's a bunch of shrub, small shrubs here, and the other one is, um, and this is fairly new. So it looks kind of raw. This is a more mature garden. Um, and you see there's no lawn at all. And there's a whole lot of, of, of a wide variety of different plants. And I'm sure you already have decided this, that this, uh, this garden on the right is, is the one that's more wildlife friendly. And in fact, it's a, a garden here in Chico uh, where the owner several years ago decided to rip out the lawn and um, plant things that were specifically chosen to be attractive to pollinators. And, and if you go out to his garden at the height of the summer, you'll, you could see up to 50 different kinds of native bees in his garden. So it's worked. Okay. Um, and I, I think it's also a lot more interesting than one on the left. I hope you agree. Okay, next one, thank you. Um, there's some wildlife friendly garden practices that you should be um, cognizant of when you're planning for wildlife. This first one is really important. You should reduce the size of your lawn or eliminate it completely. 
Um, lawns do have their uh, purpose and they're valuable in certain circumstances. They're, you know, they're good for playgrounds for, for kids and adults and animals to run around on or to play lawn games on, volleyball or badminton. Um, a good place to have picnics or just sort of lie around on the grass, very pleasant. But at the same time, they're not, they're not very useful in terms of habitat. There's not much food value. There aren't that many plants, that aren't that many um, critters that can actually eat grass like this. We never let it grow long enough that it has any seeds. Um, it may be pretty to look at, but there's, you know, there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, below the surface, there may be some invertebrates living in the ground that are valuable. And it takes a whole lot of resources to maintain this. You have to, um, you have to water it an awful lot. And in a climate like ours, it takes about, uh, it takes a huge amount of water to keep the lawn green. Uh, natives generally require a lot less water to keep them in good condition. You also have to um, use a lot of, expend a lot of energy to maintain it. You have to add fertilizer to it, which requires the use of fossil fruit fuels to make the fertilizer. You have to use, put gasoline in the lawnmower. Um, so you have to sort of think about what is the purpose of my lawn and is grass the only thing that will work? And so it, out here by the Chico airport, there's this lovely lawn by the, the entrance to the airport. And I'm thinking, what is the purpose of that lawn? Nobody is gonna go out there and play badminton on it. Uh, so maybe you could rip out that lawn and replace it with some other native plant, low growing, that would require much less water uh, to maintain it and you'd never have to mow it. And I'm often think, I often think of that movie Moonstruck with, um, with Cher and Nicolas Cage, where she slaps him on the face and says, snap out of it. You know, get over your obsession with lawns. Get a little worked up. Okay. The second wildlife friendly practice is reduce or eliminate pesticide use. Pesticides will also will kill off the beneficial insects as well as the the ones, the pesty ones. We, we, and we actually want to increase the number of insects in your garden. And you say, oh my, why would I want more insects in your garden? It's because they're, they're a good food source for the other critters. They are, a lot of insects eat plants. So they are the prime, prime one of the primary, they are a primary consumer and an important constituent of the food chain valuable resources for the animals that are higher up on the food chain. Um, so we actually want to get more insects in the yard. The more insects you have in your yard, the more other critters will come to eat those insects. So it's, um, you have to sort of, again, change your mindset a bit. You need to be willing to tolerate a, um, a little bit of insect damage in your yard. Not, uh, studies have shown that about 96% of terrestrial birds feed insects to their young. And this, a large part of that is, are caterpillars because their soft body is really palatable for the baby birds. So if you see caterpillars grazing on your plants or you see uh, many other, you see evidence of insect damage like leaves that have been bitten, that's a good thing. You know, I mean, you're, you're providing habitat for the wildlife. Okay, Joyce. Okay, now this one is, is sort of easy for me because I sort of tend to um, be in the lazy gardener club myself. You can give yourself permission to be a little lazy and a little messy. You don't need to keep everything clipped and groomed to perfection. In fact, it's a little better if you don't. In the fall, you don't need to rush out and cut everything back to the ground immediately. Let some of those dead stems still grow out. They are useful for um, providing cover over the winter for animals. Um, some animals will use them to create nests. Um, 
you don't need to write, you don't need to keep to deadhead all your flowers once they're spent. Let some of them grow to seed because those seeds will provide um, food for a lot of the birds. So you can leave, you know, leave some dead things around too, because um, native bees will like stumps or dead branches. Native bees use those to build nests. Uh, so if you can tolerate sort of not having everything completely groomed, you're actually providing um, nesting space and shelter for animals. I just, you can see from this picture from my front yard that I don't do much raking of leaves in the fall. I will rake them away so they don't completely cover my plants, but I do just let them collect on the ground. They will slowly decompose and enrich the soil and makes form the unnatural mulch. And they also provide uh, shelter for overwintering invertebrates in the soil. Okay, next. Another wildlife friendly garden practice is to aim for at least 60% native plants. So somewhere around 60% is sort of the, a good, uh, a good mixture. Um, insects and native plants co-evolved. And so native plants tend to provide better quality food than exotic, exotic or non-native plants do. And 60% means there's sort of enough food for everyone visiting your garden. Exotics don't always provide that same quality of food. And, but you know, I have um, exotic plants in my garden as well. And those are ones that I've sort of watched to see that they are providing benefit for, for the wildlife. And you can tell that because if you look at the foliage, you'll see, you'll see evidence that something's been eating the leaves. You might see pollinators coming to the flowers. You might see um, other animals coming to the, the, the berries, the fruit. You might see that there's um, animals nesting in it or sheltering under it. So if you, if you can see that an exotic is providing um, has a positive impact on the wildlife, then yeah, keep it. But natives tend to be more reliable in that regard. Uh, and if you, see, if you do have an exotic and it looks like that no animal is finding any use at all for it, then that might be one that you choose to remove and replace with a better quality native. Okay, next. Uh, excuse me. Uh-huh. Um, there, I had a question back at lawns. Before we change slides, could we make sure that anybody's questions are answered? We are going to stop periodically and answer all the questions that are accumulated. So um, okay. we just want to make sure that we get through the whole presentation. So we will come back. I've got the questions recorded, and we'll come back and address them about lawns. OK. Um, so. You need, and you need to sort of start thinking like the wildlife do. What is it that they need? And if you give them all the comforts of home, they won't have to leave. And maybe your house will be, in the wildlife world, your house will be like Bidwell Mansion. Okay, next. Okay, so what they need, specifically what they need, are food, water, shelter, and a place to raise their young. Um, this is a picture from my backyard from a few years ago. Um, this is, you can't tell from the picture, but the, the clump of grass this nest is under is purple needle grass, which is the state flower. And it sort of dies back in, uh, dies back a bit in the winter. And I was cutting it, or, you know, sort of dies a bit over the winter. And I was cutting it back in the spring to get some new fresh growth. And I was pleasantly just, Surprised to discover that um, there had been a quail nest under it the previous summer. So, the, the, you know, every once in a while you get surprises, good surprises like this in your yard. That wildlife is utilizing your yard in the, in the way that you had hoped. Okay, next. 
So we'll, we'll talk about some of these more about some of the specifics of the food, water, shelter, place to raise their young. So the big thing is, is there enough food for the critters in your yard? So this is, this is a relationship you're probably familiar with. This is a monarch caterpillar that's feeding on a narrow leaf milkweed. And you probably already have heard that milkweeds are the obligate host plant for monarch caterpillars. And there's four different species of milkweeds that are native to Duke County, and two of them are easy to find in native plant nurseries. This is the narrow leaf milkweed. There's also one called the showy milkweed. So, so an important consideration when you're planning your wildlife garden is to put um, in plenty of plants that act as host plants for, for moths and butterflies. You also want to put in nectar and pollen plants. And it, the milkweed, while it's um, host to monarchs, is also a, very attractive to all kinds of different pollinators for nectar. And in the resource list that was emailed to you on Sunday, there's um, there's a, a couple. Of, there's some valuable resources if you want to specifically start researching plants for pollinators and or for other critters. The um, the first one is this book, California Bees in Blooms, which was written by a group of professors at the Urban Bee Laboratory at Cal. They actually got a grant several years ago and they sent out researchers all over the state to um, sit in residential gardens for a few days at a time and just keep track of which pollinators came to feed at which plants, both native plants and non-native plants, what other people had, whatever the people had in their gardens. And so from that information, they got a, a wealth of data and they've compiled some specific lists of good, good plants that do well in California. There's also um, the Xerces Society. If you go to their online website, they'll have, have lists that are specific to California of pollinators, of plants and pollinator interactions. And the California Native Plant Society has a native plant database called CalScape, where you can like look up individual plants and it tells you which kind of animals it benefits. And they'll tell you if it, if it acts as a host for any particular butterflies and moths. So it's, it's getting a lot easier to get the information you need when you're choosing plants for your garden. You can also go to Floral Native Nursery here in town and um, they're very knowledgeable about the plants and you can just talk to them about the plant, kind of plants they're selling and they, they know quite a bit about them. So all, um, pollinators tend to have specific preferences for, for their flowers they'll go to for nectar and pollen. So you need to have a wide variety to accommodate all the different kinds of pollinators you might expect. So you want the, flower, the plants to vary in size in terms of height, how tall they are, in um, color, the color of the flower the floral structure, whether it has a long tube or a short tube, and um, the blooming periods. So you want to have a range in all those things. And it takes about 20 different species of plants. Okay, the problem here is that I left my, uh, I'm doing a uh, deck for Jane, yeah. the bookkeeper down in Chico. And Sorry about that. Um, okay, it happens. Um, so you need at least 20 different species to, uh, to get, to cover that range of things. Uh, in addition to, and I've just been talking about pollinators, but in terms of birds and other critters, as I said before, you can don't deadhead, deadhead your flowers right away all the time. Let some of them grow out and form seeds that provide, uh, that's a good food source. Um, and, you know, how plant shrub, shrubs that have nice berries like manzanita, 
um, flowers, mature, rented and neutered flowers are useful in themselves for pollinators and like hummingbirds. But then the flowers mature into these seeds that the birds are crazy for. So you can have plants that do sort of double duty like that. And then, as I said before, a lot of the insects will eat the foliage and some birds will eat foliage as well. So you, you have to sort of um, be willing to tolerate that in terms of providing food. Okay, next one. Okay, um, you need to have, it's helpful to have a water source. Native bees can get along without supplemental water, but, but honeybees and butterflies and then other small critters, lizards and, and small mammals and birds will appreciate extra water in your yard. So this is a picture of, from my friend's yard of the honeybees all lined up. He has a big stone trough and they just line up uh, right on the edge where the water is just kind of very damp and not deep and uh, giving a drink. It doesn't have to be as elaborate as this. It can be a bird bath. It can also just be um, a soaker hose that you turn on for a few minutes in the morning and let it get kind of wet on the hose and a little bit damp around the ground and then maybe do it again in the afternoon. It can be, um, a, sometimes I have a saucer that's filled with small pebbles and I just sort of moisten that. The butterflies tend to like that. I've seen butterflies out in the wild clustering on um, a piece of wet wood. You know, butterflies actually like that. They kind of like dabbling in it. Some, some butterflies actually like little tiny little um, muddy spots that they sort of dabble in. You can also, you can also have something more elaborate like a fountain or a small pond, but a water source is important. If, um, if, it's, if it's something like a bird bath, you'll have to change the water frequently because you don't want the water to get stagnant. Okay, next slide. I'm so apologizing for the poor quality of this picture, but this is, um, we're talking about shelter now. This is a, a simple rock pile. I, my, the soil where my house is, is quite rocky. So anytime I am digging holes uh, to plant things in, I always have to, I'm digging as many rocks out as I'm digging out the dirt. And uh, they can be small rocks or they can be large ones like this, more cobbles or stones. So I started making these piles in sunny spots around the yard and the lizards are crazy for them. It's really out of focus, but right at the top of the pile, there's a lizard basking in the sun. Um, so the lizards like this because it gives them sort of a vantage point. They're up a little bit higher off the ground so they can sort of see what's going on and they feel safe to bask in the sun and do their little push-up routine. Um, but then they can just dart into a crevice if something scary comes by. So, um, and we have, if you go out to our demonstration garden at Patrick Ranch, you'll notice in the wildlife gardens, we have some rock piles like this as well. When, as soon as I started doing these rock piles, um, Sorry. I got uh, the population of the lizards like exploded overnight. So now whenever I go outside, I generally see within the first minute, I'll see three or four lizards running around. So in addition to rock piles, you can um, do, use, be creative about using other things for shelter. You can plant things that grow in sort of a thickety, um, or, you know, they, they send up lots of stems and it forms a thicket, the quail like that too. So wild roses do that, and snowberry does that. You can have brush piles. You can have um, shrubs or trees where the branches hang down into the ground hang down to the ground, um, providing lots of shelter. So all those things can, can contribute to um, protection. You can also, there's man-made things you can buy. Um, I've seen uh, something called a toad house for sale, which is just sort of like this little ceramic pot-like thing that if you're lucky enough to have a toad or a frog in your yard, it can it's a cool spot for it to stay sheltered. You could also just take a, a clay flower pot and turn it on its side, and that makes a pretty good toad house as well. Okay, next one. 
Uh, and this shelter and place to raise their young sort of combine because the place to raise their young has to be fairly sheltered too. Um, this is a picture of redbud leaves from my yard and they've obviously been um, chewed over by an insect, but it's not eating it. It's actually, you'll notice that the holes are always circular and they're just around the perimeter of the leaf. They're not from the interior of the leaf. These holes were made by leaf cutter bees and the leaf cutter bees use these uh, to make, to construct the nest they use where they lay their eggs to raise their young. Um, most native bees are solitary bees. They don't live in hives like honeybees. Bumblebees are the only other native bee that's social in that way. Most of the California native bees are solitary and they have into each female has her own nest where she lays eggs and raises her young. So the leaf cutter bees get their name from the fact that they cut these holes out of leaves and redbud is a favorite one to make their nest. So you get, I get really excited when they see that because I don't always see the bee itself, but then I, I know that the bees have been there. So you need to have things around your yard um, that good nesting material, like um, things that the birds can use to construct their nests, twigs, dead grass, twigs, um, A lot of bees, carpenter bees, and some other bees actually chew holes in um, wood to make their nests. Um, bumblebees like cav cavities, and they often use cavities that like old rodent burrows. They're often at the base of trees. So, and a lot of the ground nesting birds actually, they need bare ground. So because they dig little holes in the ground and it, it, you've got mulch everywhere, they don't have any bare ground to do that in. So you need to um, uh, leave a little spot for the ground nesting bees to make their nests. Okay, and, uh, yeah, and now we're sort of switching to an, a technique for maximizing um, the potential for your wildlife by using what what's uh, Bay Area landscaper Sheltie Dow calls biodiversity rock stars. Cindy, so, if it's yes. okay, maybe we can address questions from the first part. Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so there are a couple questions. We'll go back to the beginning. One was, and I'm moving us along because we want to make sure we get everything in there. Right. Um, sheet mulch versus ripping out, what would be preferred when we were talking about lawn removal? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if one is preferred over the other. Um, and it's sort of, both of them take a lot of intensive work. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's a big difference. The with the sheet mulching, one pro is that the you are composting the lawn. So that's sort of improving the soil as opposed to just ripping out the grass. But sheet mulching, you have to do it well in advance before you get ready to plant. And, and the way I did it was at the end of the last, the last drought we had before the drought we're in now, I just stopped watering the lawn and just let it die. And that was sort of cheap because it was just um, sheet mulching and is sort of labor intensive and cut and digging the lawn up is also labor intensive. And as I said, I'm sort of the lazy gardener club president. So I just, I stopped watering yeah, and it took a while and the neighbors did not like it well, <laughs> because it's pretty ugly when it's going on, but that worked for me. Uh, somebody asked that question that you just addressed, the easiest way to eliminate the lawn. That was the easiest way for me. Yeah. And then another person asked about if there's an alternative to sod, just so that there is a grass area for like kids and dogs. Um, well, there, there are some, some sod companies that sell um, more drought or more water saving grass that you don't have to water as much. There's also a kind of plant 
that looks like grass, but it's not actually grass, called um, Carex is the genera. It's a sedge and it can be um, mowed like a lawn and, you, and it will tolerate some use. You can't exactly play on it as, as much as you would um, a regular lawn. That, so there are some alternatives if you look around. And then another person asked about what native plants might grow well under or around redwood trees or part shade. Well, redwood trees are tough. There's a lot of redwood trees on my yard that existed from somebody who planted them before. I don't recommend planting redwood cheese, trees here in Chico. The, they are very greedy and so they they will hog up as much moisture as they can. And the root, they find, they form this dense root mat. They have kind of shallow roots, but they, if you have more than one, they like grow their roots in together and get matted and that helps support them, even though the roots are kind of shallow. And those are really tough just to dig through. So I just, so the things that might work are things that would be normally grow under redwoods. So you would look for things that grow in the redwood forest. Unfortunately, those are gonna be um, plants that are native to the North Coast and are suitable, work better in a cooler climate and will require quite a bit of water. Um, I, I have a few things planted under them and I periodically have to go out and sort of dig around them to remove roots and try to keep enough room for the plant to go. Otherwise, a lot of them peter out after a few years. Mm. And then uh, someone else also asked about the water stagnation in the bird bath and why that might be a problem. Well, because you get this algae growth and sometimes it, it's toxic to animals that consume water and it, water with it in it. You think that in nature, you, you see birds drinking toxic uh, from algae-laden ponds, and you, not necessarily a problem, but it can, it it's just um, it's an easy thing to avoid. You don't have to worry about um, any sort of toxic algae there. Um, and the last question had to do with when you're creating shelters, uh, do you try to create shelters that don't attract rats, or are they considered part of wildlife? Well. You don't, uh, yeah, that's the thing. When I told my husband about the brush piles, he said, no rats. You, they probably will attract some, some less desirable things, but they're gonna be there anyway, even if you don't, you know. So you really can't deter the rats in that regard. So you may, you may but if you know that there's a rat problem around in your, in your neighborhood, and that might be a consideration of what what things you do and what things you don't do. Okay, so um, why don't we go ahead and move on? Um, we should probably start the video in about ten minutes. Okay, yeah, I'll be done. Some time, so we'll go ahead and and work through these slides. Okay, that way I'm getting near the end here. Okay. Yeah, so biodiversity rock stars are plants that are attracted to lots of different insects and uh, other critters that provide, um, we'll say an above average amount of value to wildlife. And if you choose a lot of those in your garden, you can really sort of maximize the potential of your garden. And fortunately, they are, there's a lot of them that are really attractive. This is, um, this, these are not only, these are rock stars here. There's three rock stars in this picture. And so it's a rock group, I guess. Um, and this is, I took this a few years ago at the entrance to Hooker Oak Park in Chico, right off Manzanita, where the roundabout is. And um, I was there just last week and it looked pretty much the same as this, only the plants were larger. And you may not be able to see them, but um, there are like, when I took this picture, there were dozens of pipe vines swallowtail butterflies swarming around the plant that's in bloom. And I'll talk about that in a bit. So anyway, the, this, I assume the city planted these and they have a, a, low, a lower plant in the foreground and then the plant that's in bloom is sort of mid-height and in the back, there's a larger plant. So you're getting 
sort of this interesting um, tableau of the, the plants there. So the one that's blooming, right, and so it blooms in, in May every year is what I think is a cultivar of Cleveland sage called Pozo Blue. It has this really beautiful bluish purple color. Um, and it, as I said before, it's very attractive to uh, pipeline swallowtail butterflies as a nectar plant, but it's also attractive to bees. There were like tons of bumblebees and carpenter bees when I visited it last week, as well as the butterflies. And then the plant in the foreground is California fuchsia, and it will bloom later on in the year. So, so maybe starting about July on through the fall. And it has red trumpet shaped flowers that are just irresistible to hummingbirds. So it's like one of the best plants for hummingbirds. And the plant in the back, the taller one is a manzanita, a cultivar called Howard McMinn. And it blooms in maybe um, end of January and February with these small urn shaped flowers that um, are kind of uh, pinkish, uh, pale pink. Very attractive. Again, bees and uh, hummingbirds really like those. So, so here, you, so you not only have um, plants that are attractive to more than one kind of insect or pollinator or bird, um, it also covers a, a blooming, a long blooming period. And it, these have been planted there for several years, so it's fairly long lasting. And the city, it looks like the city comes by and prunes it maybe once a year. So it's not, doesn't take a huge amount of work. Okay, next. So here's a list of some other rock star native plants. These are the, the and there's lots of different species in each one of these groups. So you have a, a choice. And we'll all be talking in more detail about some of these later, and we'll have some pictures to show you of some of these. But I wanted to talk a little bit now about annual wildflowers. This is a really easy and inexpensive way to get into growing natives, is purchasing packets of wildflowers. Sometimes you can even get packets of mixed California wildflowers. Just be careful that you check the packet to make sure they're actually California wildflowers and not just North American wildflowers. And that um, they haven't thrown in things that are um, non-native, you know, not even native to North, North America. So you wanna get some sort of a reputable dealer and maybe not like, when I was little, they used to sell like wildflower packets at the gas stations and stuff. I guess they thought you could throw them out the window as, as you were driving down the road. So you want to get them from a reputable source. But you can create really stunning meadows in the spring filled with wildflowers and maybe a few native bunch grasses. Uh, another tip is make sure you know what they look like when they're just, when they're seedlings. So you can, because you will be getting weeds and you'll have to pick weeds out. So you need to be able to tell the difference between the wildflowers and the seed and just weeds. So, um, so that's an easy and, and fun, uh, fairly easy and fun and inexpensive way to get started with plant with planting natives. The, the drawback is, is that once they're done blooming, then you'll have nothing growing in that patch. So you have to sort of figure out what to do. But if they like where you planted them, then they'll, they'll reseed themselves and they'll come back the following year without you having to do anything at all which is a big bonus, except for weeding. There's always the weeding. Okay, I think, I think this is the end of the PowerPoint. So I think we were gonna show the video now. Yeah, did you wanna show the examples that we took out at the branch? Yeah, well, we can do that now. Yeah, let's do that now since they're up. Yeah. Okay, so, so on the right, and let me talk about the one on the right first. Oaks. Are, are a fabulous group. They're one of the best natives in terms of hosting insects. This is a valley oak, Quercus lobata, that's right next to the habitat garden at 
our native habitat garden at Patrick Ranch. So it's we didn't plant it obviously because look how huge that thing is. I'm down at the bottom. I'm not a midget down at the bottom. Um, the there's at least the Valley Oak hosts at least 17 different kinds of butterflies and moths. That's confirmed. The list of likely hosts is 150. So if you are lucky enough to have room, you either have an oak in your yard or you have room to plant one, um, they're great. It's just, you have to watch out about gardening under them because they, their, their roots are a little bit finicky. And they're, but oaks are important in addition to the, uh, being a host plant, it's important to birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, and insects. Um, the one on the left is the naked stem buckwheat. There's many, so it's one of the species of buckwheat. Um, and it's called naked stem because you can see it gets these long, the, the flowers on top of these long stems that don't have any leaves on them. So the stems are naked. Um, they, it hosts at least nine different butterflies and moths. And it's also very important for native bees, butterflies, and other pollinators. There, we have four different um, buckwheats growing out in the native plant gardens at Patrick Ranch. So you can go out there on public viewing days, which are, I think they're back up on, they're open on the weekends again now and see them. You can see them there at the ranch when they're in bloom. And they're just, they're just coming into bloom now. Okay. And this is, uh, the one on the left is from Joyce's yard. It's a Matilia hop poppy, which has one, I think it's the largest flower of any of the California natives. It can be, get to be about 10 inches across. So, and it grows on this um, ro very robust um, bush that's just sensational. Um, it's, it's, it's one, it hosts one, it's host to one insect and it supports bees and butterflies. It can be an aggressive spreader, but, so you have to keep pulling out um, unwanted roots. But it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great plant. The one on the right is a penstemon. Uh, its common name is scarlet bugler. So it's one of three penstemon that's growing out at Patrick Branch. And this one is very drought tolerant. Um, you don't really need to give it water during the summer once it's established. And it has these long trumpet-shaped red flowers, which are very attractive to hummingbirds. It, uh, it's likely hosts 14 different species of moths and butterflies. There it is, but it's also important to native bees and hummingbirds as well. It's, um, the penstemons as a, as a genus are not particularly long-lived. So, you know, maybe four or five years, and then you'll have to replace them. But the bonus is that they reseed themselves very readily. So usually then just, um, I just, at my own yard, I will like dig up one of the volunteers I have growing and move it into wherever I need to, um, where other things have died. And that's happening out of the garden too. We lost a couple of the original penstemon and we're just filling in with, with transplants, volunteers from other parts of the garden. Okay. Okay, on, on the left here is the California fuchsia that I talked about before in, um, with the Biostar, with the rock group. Um, so you see, you see it, it's another one that spreads, can be an aggressive spreader and you sort of have to control it, but it, it's, blooms in a very long period uh, for a long period and also the period of you know late summer and fall when there's not much else in bloom so it's a great one okay and the one on the right is uh, and the other milkweed that's easy to obtain in butte county the showy milkweed so this is one that way it looked in april in um out at patrick ranch so it has this sort of felty, felty feeling leaves, and you can see where the flower heads are beginning to form down in the center. Milkweeds have really interesting flower, um, 
structures. And they're very complicated and they have specialized parts that other flowers don't have. So they're sort of unique in that regard. And if you look at it, it kind of reminds you, think of a crown, think of one of a really complicated crown that Queen Elizabeth might wear, kind of like that, the structure. It reminds me very much of like a crown. Um, and, and we know that um, the, it's the host plant for monarchs as well as being a fabulous nectar plant and has very interesting seed pods. Okay, next one. So I think uh, that was the end of the picture. That was the end, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, stop that screen share and now share. There was one question before we watched the video and okay. that to do with a reputable, reputable wildflower um, dealer for seed. Okay, there's um, Larner Seeds. So I think, I don't know if they're on the list. Is it on your page? Yeah, on the... Yeah, it's there. Yeah, okay. yeah, if you look under Where to Buy Natives, I have some Larner Seeds and Seed Hunt. There's also, um, I didn't put it on here, but um, Theodore Payne Nursery in Southern California will sell wildflower seeds by mail. Okay. Seed Hunt is um, like a one person operation, but she has a fabulous selection of seeds, both native and non-native, but her website is not very um, impressive, but don't be put off by that. Okay, and someone else asked about milkweed companion plants. Milkweed what? Companion plants. Gee, I, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. I know. Yeah, uh, I, I don't. I don't know. In the garden, the pic last picture that we showed actually had it in the middle of all that California fuchsia. Yeah. So, so the California fuchsia has grown into the milkweed. I guess milkweeds. So. All the milkweeds tend to spread out. Well, the showy milkweed and the narrow leaf milkweed tend to spread out. They'll send out long runners, and they move. In my own garden, they seem to move wherever they want to move. So I don't know if they have a special affinity for any particular plants. So that's something I don't know. Okay, well, we're gonna go ahead and start the video. Okay. And, um, if you, as I'm screen sharing here, if you want to talk about anything, any introduction before we get started, uh, play it. Okay, so this, this video was taken a month ago um, out at Patrick Ranch. So, um, so, and I'm, I'm talking about some of the things that I, um, I'll be talking more in depth about some things and I'll, or I'll be just sort of touching bases on some of the things I've already talked about and then there'll be some new things, but you'll also be able to see the, the plants in place and you'll be able to look at the habitat garden and see um, things about them. And I talk about mulch. I haven't talked about mulch too much in my presentation, but I'll be talking about mulch. So there'll be some new things and then there'll be some review things. Right, here we go. Master Gardener Demonstration Gardens, which are a series of different themed planting beds. And I'm standing in between the two ones that are primarily made natives. There are actually natives in just about every other themed garden, but these are the ones that are exclusively native. So over here, we have what was designed to be sort of a showcase garden, uh, a bit more like a traditional um, California garden, and um, with plants that are easy to grow and also quite attractive to look at. But on the other side here is the one that's designed to be a wildlife garden. You'll see that it, it's a little bit less formal looking, a little bit more untidy looking, that the plants were chosen for their value to wildlife. And there's other aspects of the garden that I'll be talking about later on. But let's imagine that you decide that you want to put in a native plant. And so where do you start? If you're starting from a brand new house, completely bare soil, or you've decided to rip out everything you have and you're starting with black slate, you're going to make 
certain kind of choices, but it will be easier because you'll be able to plan everything at once. But like most of us, you're in a place that has a lot of other traditional landscape plants, and you have to decide how do I go about introducing natives. And that's what I did at my house. In this case, we were starting with what used to be part of the farmland that was bare, except for the weeds that were covering it. We decided we had to decide what we were going to put in and how we were going to do it. So then when you start out by thinking about your orientation in terms of north, south, east, west, which will and and tell you where what's going to be in shade during parts of the day, what's going to be in sun. So in this case, east is this direction. So as the as sun moves across the sky, the part over here that's in shade in the morning will become in the afternoon we'll have the western sunshine running. We also have this established valley oak tree which is lovely and we can sort of integrate it into our wildlife habitat. But it's going to cast a lot of shade down on this, this side, especially um, and up into here during the morning. In this area, we were a bit concerned about soil compaction from construction that went on when the visitor center was being built. Some of the other gardens closer to the visitor center had spots where plants just wouldn't grow well until we went in and compacted the soil, had to aerate it and move it around. So here we decided that we would work the soil a bit with some um, tractors that came in and sort of moved the soil around. And then we added additional um, things to improve the drainage. So we used a lot of this uh, lava, this red lava fine, um, was incorporated into the soil along with another topsoil that we brought in. So we wound up with this burr. And then we wound up using the excess lava fines from mulch that works pretty well in this garden. And I'll talk about mulch a little bit later. Um, so then you so start thinking about what plants you want. So you need to start think about, you know, is this site going to be sun all day? Is it going to be shaded in the morning? Is it going to be shaded in the afternoon? That will help you determine what kind of plants are appropriate for that area. You also want to think about in terms of the soil, as I just said, is the soil well drained? Drain. Most California natives prefer well drained soil. So you have to um, uh, do some testing to make sure that that's appropriate if the plant is appropriate. Um, if the soil isn't particularly well drained, then you want to either improve it or you're going to have to shift to stick with plants that do well in heavy clay, wetland kind of plants. Generally, there's no need to add extra amendments like nitrogen to soil. California natives don't need a lot of nitrogen. The only thing to be, you might want to add is like we did, we added some um, amendments to improve drainage. The other things that you want to consider is how are you going to use the garden? Um, what kind of plants are, are you going to need? Do you want trees in there? Do you want um, things to cast shade? If you're looking in terms of uh, what's appropriate for wildlife, which I assume you are, um, you'll want to have a variety of different things. And you can research natives by going to native plant nurseries like Floral Native Nursery here in Chico. Or I really recommend a website called calscape.org, which is sponsored by the California Native Plant Society. And it's a list of sort of all the California natives that are in propagation. And you, you, if you go in and put in your address, so you'll come up with a whole bunch of suggestions of appropriate plants. You can research them and it tells you a bit about their plant requirements. And then there's all kinds of other reference sources online that you can use. Okay, so in, when you're getting ready to choose plants, you really need to take into consideration how large they'll be when mature. The tendency is to pack them pretty close together when they're young and then they'll be overcrowded when they're grown. So be sure to check out the mature size of plants. In terms of having a nice wildlife habitat, you're going to want to have a wide variety of different kinds of plants, different sizes, different um, shapes. 
different uh, shapes of the flowers, different colors. Um, a lot of pollinators have kind of specific taste about what they want to go to and you want to provide a wide variety. Another thing is the size of the flowers. Some bees with long tongues prefer flowers that have long floral shoots, where bees with short tongues can't get access to nectar in the long tube flowers like pensament. So they, they want to have things that are easier for them to access, like flowers that are sort of daisy-like in appearance. So you want to extend your blooming period as much as possible by choosing plants that bloom uh, at different periods of the growing season. So you, in the attempt to have continuous bloom from the beginning of the season to the end, that will um, be most useful for the critters that are coming into your garden. The pollinators will be attracted for a long period. You'll have different kinds of pollinators at different times of the year. You'll have things, fruits maturing at different times, which are useful for the critters that eat them. When you plant, you want to make sure if you're using drip or other sort of automatic irrigation, make sure that you root plants on the same line that have similar water requirements. Because if you just sort of mix up the plants that are on the line, you may find out that you have to water for the plant that has the greatest water need. And that means you're overwatering the other plants and, and wasting water. So, and that brings up the fact a lot of people think because they're natives, they don't need to be watered. And that's um, not true, even though they are native and they have lower drought requirements when they're established when you first plant them in your garden you'll need to provide some irrigation during the summers especially and that generally holds true for about two or three years before they're well established at that point a lot of natives won't need any further irrigation except possibly during drought winters they might supplement the water then some are going to need irrigation bit about irrigation continuously um, from then on depending on where the plant was from originally it's useful when you're choosing plants to to look at where what part of california the plant is native to because california has a lot of different habitats that are different and they have different amounts of rainfall so if you want to plant something that is native to North Coast, like around Eureka or Crescent City, is when you, if you move it to Chico and try to grow it here, it's going to need a lot more water. Um, if you're choosing something from the desert, you won't have to worry about it not having enough, not having enough water. It's that it might have too much water here in Chico. Although there are a lot of desert things you can grow. So. But if you choose something that maybe grows nat native to the su Southern California, the inland area around Riverside County, uh, it might do pretty well here in Chico and you might not have to use artificial water or, or supplemental water during the summer at all. I wanted to talk a little bit about the differences between the showcase garden and the habitat garden. The showcase garden, as I said previously, was designed to be kind of a using really plants that were especially attractive that would blend in very well with uh, traditional garden plants, weren't too fussy, and um, had a bit of a formal appearance, didn't require a lot of pruning, didn't get real raggedy. So those were our plant choices. And you can see that a lot of these are kind of neat and tidy looking plants, but that when they're blooming or they can be spectacular, some of them have foliage and it's really nice in the fall. We also use this, uh, as I said before, that we, um, in preparation, we added a lot of this um, fine, these lava fines to increase drainage in this. And then we decided to use it as a mulch. So it's a bit of an unconventional choice for mulch. 
that it looks a little bit neater and uh, does a really good job on weed suppression. The cons of it is when, it, when weeds do come through, you have to be careful about pulling them out because you get, when you pull the weeds out, then you'll get dirt all over the top of your mulching and a little bit messy. So it requires a little bit more maintenance. But when the plants are blooming, they really pop against this mulch. Okay, so now we're down here at the, uh, the habitat garden. So it has a, a different look than the showcase garden. It's a little bit, uh, has a wild aesthetic, we'll say. Things are a little bit untidier. The plants aren't necessarily uh, as spectacular looking, but it has real wildlife benefits. A lot of, the, and I should say that a lot of the plants that are in the showcase garden are actually very good for wildlife gardens too. So you can actually sort of have a mixture of the two kinds of plants. But this one, you'll notice that we have a nice water feature over there. So, uh, which, and some warnings in from over there, there's bees all over that, honeybees. Native bees don't need well, extra water, but honeybees appreciate it. And sometimes there's other animals as well, too. We've got um, some lots of rock piles for critters to uh, find shelter in, and the lizards especially like them. Um, or when they get up there and they sun themselves and they do that sort of push up thing which is so cute. We've got some, some log bits around which provide nesting material, nesting places for bees. And we've used um, bark mulch here. The one um, drawback of the, the lava finds is that it's hard for birds to scratch through them and look for bugs underneath, whereas the, the bark mulch, it's easy for the birds to scratch it up. So here we've provided um, different uh, plants that have different kinds of food value for the animals, water, places where they can shelter, and places besides the rock piles for things like lizards. Birds like to go and see how thickety this California rose has got. It's like a little thicket growing in there. And the snowberry down there is the same way. It's a great place for birds to go in and feel protected. Sometimes they, they can even build their nests and protect it, but for the ground nesting birds, they're looking for protected places to build their nests. So that's what you need uh, for a habitat garden. You need to make it like home and then they won't have any need to go anywhere else. <laughs> Okay, so um, I have one last thing I'd like to say. Sure. I left out from the other presentations is that fall is the best time to plant natives because the ground is cooling down then and you'll hopefully you will tap into the winter rains if we have winter rains and you can plant on into the winter. Planting now is really difficult just because the, root, the roots are trying to get established and it's too hot and you can't get them enough water. But now's a great time to be planning for your, transforming your garden into a real wildlife habitat. And then you can get all your lists together and you'll be ready to go in the fall when it's the best time to plant. Great. And there's a couple questions, Cindy. One, okay. just uh, the most current question is about the rock piles. And is it hollow inside? Is there just a pile of rocks? That it's, just, it's just rocks piled up one on top of the other. And the only criteria is try to get it sort of steady so they're not falling down all the time. Okay. And, and, then, uh, and, and you know, out at, out at Patrick Ranch, we had access to different kinds of rocks. So those are like sort of larger and flatter and they can pile up a little higher. And, yeah. you know, I, the lizards aren't real particular. Okay. And there was one other question about the fire hazard related to manzanita and other native plants. Yeah, it's, it's true that certain plants like manzanita can um, have um, resins and then that are uh, burned quite well. So if you're in a, an area of fire concern, you don't want to have the manzanita planted right up close to the house. So you want to, you'd probably want to put it in the zone that's more than 30 feet away from your house yeah. and have it uh, not touching other plants. So it would be sort of isolated. 
So even if it does burn, it would be less likely to catch something else on fire. That it has so much wildlife value, I really hesitate to say don't plant it, but just be really careful about how you orient it. I think the other issue, having had lots of manzanita, is there's a lot of dead growth as it grows. Yeah. There's a lot of dead underneath, and so keep. I would keep a lot of that pruned. And yeah, I, yeah, and I. A lot of people like to prune it out anyway and not have it so dense because I. And that's what I've been doing. I sort of, as it grows, I prune out some of the interior branches, because then it reveals the sort of real beauty of the sort of contorted shape with the reddish bark yeah. of the branches and and. Uh, thins it out so there's less flammable material there. So does anybody else have questions before we um, come to an end? You can chat or unmute. Um, Ellen says thank you to everybody. And Melissa, thank you. So we want to thank you for joining us this morning with um, Cindy and the Native Plant Talk. Um, it will be made available. You'll receive a YouTube link and also a link to an evaluation and the PowerPoint as a PDF. So you'll have all the information that you should hopefully need. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Now, if I can figure out how to stop recording, I'll be good. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Okay.